So, uh, gaming, am I right? With all the wild stuff happening in the industry, less than desirable quality products, and the behemoth of cost for some things that just really don't feel worth it lately, it's kind of driven me back into games that I had growing up, or games that I wanted to play always and are much, much cheaper now, especially now that I have totally responsible adult money. Well, yes, I do live paycheck to paycheck, but at least I have my sweet little treats to keep the existential dread at bay, for now. As most people who buy and play games today know, lots of different forms of media are becoming a bit harder and harder to play, or even just find. That, or they're unceremoniously bludgeoned to death behind an Applebee's when no one's looking. We're seeing an ever-increasing trend of random delisting, sunsetting, or straight-up abandoning experiences for games, video, and music services long before they should be. Because of this, I feel like I'm starting to hit my midlife crisis button a bit early. So much so that for the last three years, I've been trying to track down a reasonably priced copy of a racing game that I had only ever played the beta for way back in 2010. And that game is none other than Yaris. Blur. Oh yeah, right. Side note though, I've been so avid about tracking down some of these delisted games that I did track down a copy of Yaris on the Xbox 360, but it was on a memory card that someone was selling, and I bought it just to say that I have it. Now, it took a hard look on eBay, and I had to look in the UK, and then fight back and forth to get the damn thing shipped for over a month, and after all was said and done, it finally arrived. In a colon collection bag packaging. Now you may be thinking, Chipmunk, why waste so much time hunting down games that no one plays anymore? Well, it's quite simple, really. I'm fucking stupid because for years I thought that not just delisted games and lost media were cool, but this game in particular was the cool kids club. You know what I mean? It had it all. Real life cars that you could race, neon everything, and essentially a grown up fighting style like Mario, but cooler. It even had heavy smashing into opponents, extreme crashes and explosions, even shooting bolts at people. Hello? I mean, hell, even the marketing for this game was like this too. The angsty teen in me was itching to grow up and be the cool guy, a man, an adult. Forget Baby Mario and Baby Ouija, it was time that I graduated from Rainbow Road and flexed my sick muscles and peach fuzz on my face to impress all the ladies. Now, Blur came out at arguably the worst time to release not just a racing game, but to be honest, release a game at all. Forza was still dominating the scene with Forza 2, Split Second released like a week before. The Halo Reach beta had also just finished up in the height of Halo 3 less than a week before Blur's release. With all this and more surrounding its release window, it's not really rocket science that Blur only sold 31,000 copies within its first week, going on to only sell half a million copies total not even a year later, which ultimately led to being the unfortunate reason that Bizarre Creations was shut down, which is kind of crazy that the studio that made Geometry Wars also made blur, and of the two, this is what killed it? Like, to put it in perspective, this is the same studio that made Project Gotham Racing 1, 2, 3, and 4. Racing games weren't new to them. This should have been an easy slam dunk. Now, I have a feeling what kind of sealed the deal on this game's failure and the ultimate studio closure was when Nick Davies, a producer at Bizarre Games, had said that the multiplayer aspect of the game is what would essentially keep the game alive, and that this was going to be a slow burner while also promising more Blur games in the future. I don't know about you, but saying something like that when your game kind of failed miserably right out of the gate, I feel really didn't instill confidence in both consumers or investors. But let me land. I'm going to be honest for a minute here and say that I feel like Nick would have been right, had everything else during that time not completely knocked it out of the park. I mean, seriously, how can you possibly compete with something like Red Dead Redemption, a new Pokemon game, and Halo Reach, all being released in the year that you launched the game? Sure, diehard racing fans would taste it, love it, and maybe even tell their friends, but good luck getting anyone else to expand their horizons with the lineup that 2010 had. I will say though, that had this game been released today, odds are the same thing probably would have happened. Unfortunately, for different reasons. Forza has kind of burned people out while also changing the expectation of racing games with both the mainline games and Horizon. Need for Speed exists, kind of. As many of us know, the crew is absolutely getting destroyed currently. Gran Turismo had a movie. Oh, uh, F1 also still makes games. Shout out to Shaikul Chris on that one. And last but not least, NASCAR, well, you get it. 
All of this to say that I'm more than positive that the focus for Blur's development, had it been released now, would have more than likely been a microtransaction hellscape mixed with licensing hell, and it would have either led to the same issues that plagued it back in 2010, or worse ones from the gaming landscape that we have now. Which really kind of sucks, because at its core, Blur is a good game. It just unfortunately didn't capture people's attention at the right time. The multiplayer and overall gameplay really did deliver, and even with my rose-colored glasses off, I still do believe that in 2024, the game is certified absolutely capital F-U-N fun. They had four-person split-screen and 20-player multiplayer lobbies. That's a lot of cars, dude. How could you not think that that's a good time? Not to mention, Blur also had some cool, at the time, social features, like an in-game website integration and social media integration. Unfortunately, those don't work now. And the website's dead. But hey, we still have Xbox messages. Never mind. Now I say all this because there is still a very passionate player base out there that has an active Discord, and they have frequent game nights from what it seems. But because the game is delisted, and it's a PC-focused group, that kind of really didn't help me any. And while I got very, very lucky with a $5 key for Spec Ops The Line after that was delisted, shout out to my wife for that one, and I recently got a $30 copy physically off of eBay, managing to completely bypass all the scalping, I can't really say that I'm itching to drop essentially the price of a used car to go drive a fake one on PC, especially when I already have the game for the platform that I wanted it for. Now, there is a way that they show in the server that you can still play with some kind of service in a private server, I think, but I'll be honest, I'm not really the most computer literate person, so for now, I've opted to just ride with what I've got. Maybe that changes in the future, but if if you do want to check it out, I've got their info below in the description. Now what I can attest to though, is that while the multiplayer on the Xbox 360 is emptier than my wallet after I pay my rent, the single player is a really fun experience, and at times is kind of an absolute monster of a challenge. And I'm very confident in that, because my coconut brain decided that it would be a good idea to try to 100% it on my first ever playthrough instead of just playing the fucking game and going back later. But because of that incredibly stupid choice, I actually learned a lot about how to approach these challenges within the game as they got progressively harder. Can't figure out how to get that tiny little bit of speed you need to pass everyone? The off-road cars might be the move to help you cut some corners, or you can just bully the cars ahead of you with bolts and shunts. Having some trouble keeping your first place spot? Stack up a few mines and yeet them forward to the car that stole your lead, or make a spread for those behind you to hit them. Even finding small tricks for the destruction challenges, or which cars work better for long stretches of road versus tight corners. Everything all the way down to what mods work best for your racing style, it all comes together from that heavy repetition of trying to get that last damn bit of fans to pass the fucking chat. Sorry, I'm still a little bit jaded about this. For context, the single player is set up in events, not unlike most racing games, and it has a certain number of stars, or I guess in this case light levels and fan levels to progress. Earn enough lights from placing top three or hitting fan goals and time gate challenges and races, you unlock more races and events. To get the final race in each event, you'll have to complete specific challenges in order to unlock them, which at times can be really frustrating or stupidly easy. Keeps you on your toes, I guess, you know? What's really neat about Blur though, is that when you do beat a boss, you not only get the coveted pink slip to their car for your collection, but you also unlock special mods for their car that you can use in other races. All of these have unique quirks that give you a bit more of an edge for your races, and trust me, you're gonna need them. The only downsides I ran into while playing though, is that while the races leading up to a boss can be very levels of difficulty, even when you put on a specific difficulty for the races, pretty much every time so far I've absolutely dog walked the bosses, which is pretty weird considering that it should be the hardest fight for a leg up in a race. Okay, so when I originally wrote this script, I hadn't finished the game yet, but then I got a bug up my ass after playing some on stream and I really wanted to finish it, so I did. And wow, I got my ass handed to me after I decided that. Needless to say, I was very humbled. Something to keep in mind though is that while each car is better equipped to handle certain terrain, track types, and driving styles, there's not always good options when trying to do some of these challenges, but also win a race. Sometimes it was me changing up cars for each race or challenge, and other times it was just kind of clinging to one car because, well, it did it last time, fuck it, YOLO. Oftentimes though, I found myself trading off a first place win just to make sure I got the fan gates completed, or ignoring the gate and fan goals completely just to win first place. It's not really something I had a lot of fun with, but I dug my grave to 100% it, so I kind of had to lay in it. 
The last thing I'm kind of on the fence about it being a downside, or just Blur's unique draw, is that in typical racing games, they let you earn XP or whatever it is in that game, simply for just finishing top 5, top 3, or even just finishing at all. But Blur is very unforgiving in that, that if you don't place top 3, you get nothing. This kind of thing really forces you how to learn how to actually drive on the track you're on, use power-ups most effectively, and most importantly, how to prioritize winning over just racing. Now, what I will appreciate, though, is that the conditions to get the final race in an event group, you can earn those and still lose the race. Thank God, because some of the later ones really felt impossible at times. In many ways, Blur was everything that I wanted and more, especially after wanting to play it for 14 years. And as I learned more about the game, its life, and the situation surrounding it, I came to appreciate it even more, especially now that I finally have it and beat it. From the big hair-splitting moments of being bullied or being the bully, the nail-biting finishes that you're fighting for your life on, all the way down to the small features like the recap it gives you from the last time that you played when you boot the game up again. Blur just constantly gives me something that unfortunately very few games released today do. Unapologetic fun that I can just play whenever I want and it just works. As the ever-approaching death date of July 29th, 2024 gets closer and closer, I'm trying my hardest to experience games that I never was able to before, or games that once this door closes, will be lost forever without proper preservation. DLCs for things like Assassin's Creed, songs for Rocksmith 2014, even things like The Crew. Granted, that one's for the Xbox One, and also coincidentally a delisted racing game. Games like this do still have players who love and cherish them, but unfortunately, because there's no offline mode for a lot of these like the crew, that's all going to be lost. This is sadly going to be a huge talking point, not just this year, but over the next few years, as the ability to have media preservation gets worse and worse with very little hope in sight. It's really hard to believe that we'll be able to play much of anything that isn't modern without shelling out a bunch of money. Finding working old consoles, or ever depleting copies of physical games, even situations like Best Buy halting physical media sales is incredibly scary. But there is a little bit of hope. There's projects out there like the Insignia Project for the original Xbox that's trying to give people a private and safe way to play their games again online. A monumental task for sure, but still a really cool one. This problem is so alarming, actually, that a study from the Video Game History Foundation found that 87% of classic video games released in the United States are critically endangered. And as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this topic and wanting to experience games in their original formats as best we can. This is all really frustrating to see, and I hope that both my ignited passion for Blur as well as media preservation kind of helps push forward the work that's being done by people way bigger on this than I to keep our games playable and documented. I want to say thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to learn more about some of the things I mentioned here, check the description for any links directing to those topics. And the final thing I want to do in this video is say this. It's really important that we all come together to be able to talk about this kind of thing, really push for legislation and copyright laws to be changed so that our favorite games, shows, and music can all be preserved safely, legally, and accessibly. So I encourage you to get involved, contact your lawmakers, and really just see if there's anything that you can do to help contribute to the fight against all of our media being lost. Thank you so much again for watching the video, and I hope to see you in the next one.